Welcome to Sexology, a podcast that untangles the science of sex and pleasure. And now, with this week's episode, your host, clinical psychologist, Dr. Nazanin Moali. Hello and welcome to episode 230 of Sexology Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Nathanin Moali. Today we're going to talk about polyamory with one of my colleague, Marta Kalpi. Before I tell you more about this episode, I wanted to take a minute and invite you to check out our free checklist of 101 ways to spice up your sex life with your partner. I included some of my favorite tips that, that I gathered throughout the years. And there's some suggestions around how to spice up foreplay and core play, regardless of how kinky or how conservative you are. The checklist is on the show notes and all you need to do is click and sign up for it. As I mentioned earlier, we're welcoming back my colleague, Martha. Martha was our guest in two, two previous episodes, and she's just published this awesome book called Polyamory, a Clinical Toolkit for Therapists and Their Clients. Actually, I think it gets released this week. And we're going to talk all about polyamory and consensual non-monogamous relationships. Our guest is Martha Cowpey. Marta is an educator, ASAC certified sex therapist and supervisor, and also she's an AMFD approved supervisor. She specializes in relational sex therapy, including alternative family structures and trains therapists to work effectively at the intersection of sex issues and relational challenges. As a way to prepare for this episode, I started doing some Googling online to see what are some of the questions that people have about this topic. According to Google, these were some of the most searched statements around polyamory. Polyamory is toxic, polyamory is wrong, polyamory is for losers, polyamory is bad, polyamory is selfish, polyamory is just an excuse, polyamory is not cheating. So if if you type one of those statements in, in your search bar, this is for you. Martha is going to tell you all about working with clients who identify as polyamorous, and she's going to tell us if that's something that's workable or not. All right, without Without further ado, here's my conversation with Martha Kalpi. Hello and welcome to another episode of Sexology Podcast. I am so excited to have Martha Kalpi back on our show. Martha, welcome to our show. Thank you so much. I'm super excited to be here. Well, before we started recording, I was sharing with you how much I love the book that you just published. And I had a hard time choosing a right section for our conversation because it's wealth of great knowledge. So tell us, how did you get interested in writing this book? Well, I see a lot of clients that are in open relationships, consensually open relationships of various types. And my clients were telling me that they were having a hard time finding a therapist. So client after client after client, sort of shocking. People saying, when I opened my relationship, I stopped being able to see the relationship therapist I had been seeing. Or we opened our relationship and then we encountered some challenges. We tried to find a therapist and the therapist just told us the solution to your problem is to be monogamous, but we don't want to be monogamous. And so we that therapist didn't work for us. And I just thought, wow, there's like a huge knowledge deficit here for therapists to have an idea of how to work with polyamory and other consensual non-monogamies. Well, I'm glad that you wrote this book because it had tons of good information for general public, but also for therapists. One of the things that I've been doing a lot during pandemic as I've been, there's this newish social media platform called Clubhouse. Have you had experiment, experience with that? I haven't, no. So it's an audio only platform and it's like another form of social media. But what I love is that you can give conversa- have conversation with colleagues and people. So it's like partly like a podcast, partly people are joining you. And what's interesting is I've been fortunate I've, uh, to be on panels with my colleagues, other therapists, other psychologists. And while we're answering questions on different panels, when people asking about non-monogamy, it, there is this silence in the room 
home and people kind of refer people to me. And I was like, anyone can talk about this, any like couple therapist, you know, that you would think that relationships, of course, there are some differences or some nuances, but it's just not something that you could need to go to a sex therapist to talk about polyamory, so which makes me wonder that sometimes I feel therapists are conflicted about whether this is a workable solution for people or not. So tell us, I know in the book, you talk about who can benefit from consensual non-monogamy. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Absolutely. And first of all, I just want to say absolutely polyamory can work beautifully well for the long haul. I know lots of people who are in open relationships that have really stood the test of time like decades. And so that was one of the reasons that I wrote the book. The things I was learning from therapists, I had a professor who told me, yeah, I've worked with some people who were in polyamorous relationships and it seemed like one or the other partner always had a mother who had a personality disorder. And I just thought, this just, that may or may not be, that's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous overgeneralization for any group of people, but it just seemed for an otherwise fabulous professor that I adored, it just seemed like a big gaping hole that we don't know as a culture, we don't have an understanding that this is a workable relationship shape. So that's my like my most huge pressing, please everybody get this kind of message is it absolutely can work. It does not work for everybody, but you may have noticed that monogamy doesn't work for everybody either. And there's no reason to think that it can't stand the test of time or that people can't work with the challenges that they encounter and gain some more skills and develop a really securely bonded, connected, long-term stable situation. So anybody who wants to be in an open relationship will benefit from having a therapist who thinks it's okay for them to be in a consensually open relationship. I mean, can you imagine being in a monogamous relationship and going to a therapist and them saying, well, your problem is that monogamy doesn't work? I mean, it's just like, what? Like, you just You can't say that about somebody's goals for themselves and expect to keep the client. So I do think that there are some kinds of situations that come up where I've seen opening the relationship in one way or another be helpful. And one example is when one partner wants just a lot more sex or sex of a different kind than the other partner, and they're not able to resolve that impasse in another way, or opening the relationship isn't that big of a stretch for them. For some people, it's like, oh, yeah, we could try that. And they may encounter some hurdles along the way and have some growth that they need to go through. But for many people, it's entirely workable. And so a situation like that, part of the problem in the dynamic of a desire discrepancy that's pretty big like that is that the higher desire partner tends to kind of feel a lot of urgency for sex. And there's this pressury dynamic. And unfortunately, any little whiff of pressure for sex actually kills desire. So it is a, it's a dynamic that gets worse and worse and worse. And one way to break that gridlock is for the higher desire partner to go have other partners and then they're no longer pressuring their original partner for sex. And then the entire dynamic changes and you can't know exactly what's going to happen next or how the dynamic is going to change. But I've never seen a desire discrepancy with a pressury dynamic for sex change for the better without the pressure going away first. So this is just one way that a couple might do that. Another situation I've seen really benefit people to open is if somebody wants to explore kink, one partner really has a particular interest in a particular kind of sexual expression that the other partner is not interested in, then you know, kink is a thing that a person can explore outside of their relationship in a vast variety of different ways of varying levels of sensual, sexual, sexy, doesn't necessarily involve any particular activity. And that one has a lot of range for couples to decide, well, I don't feel comfortable with this, but maybe we could have you explore kink at kink events and reserve this aspect just for us. And so that I've seen work a lot. I've also seen it come up for couples where one person either always has known or has recently discovered that they identify as bisexual and they want to explore their bisexuality. And one of the sort of obvious aspects of monogamy is there's only one partner. So, you know, in most cases, that partner has one gender, not always, but mostly. 
And so if you want to explore sexual intimacy with another gender, you would need another partner. So that's another situation where if we're thinking about a culture of monogamy, then we think we have to break up over these things. And if we're thinking of a culture where there's the possibility to explore opening up, all of a sudden, we don't have to assume that a breakup is the only solution. And so it's a way to actually save relationships that I think have many, many strengths and also could really benefit from the pressure coming off of some aspect of the sexual dynamic or a broader range of exploration. You know, what's interesting is with uh, with Clubhouse's social media platform, I, I got exposure to uh, like random people, like they're not my clients, they're not friends. And I got exposed to the galaxy of people. They're talking about their experiences and honest way. And they're talking about how some of them, they had reservations about open relationships and they explored it. And through the kind of good communications boundaries that they had, they found that uh, being completely workable and it, it was something that they found comfort in it. So I don't know if it's a, it's like people are more open about it now, or it's more common. What do you think about it? Because I certainly compared to like 15 years ago, I hear more about it, like people openly talking about it. I think it is more common now. I also think it's more visible now. So there have been some book, big books written about it, like uh, what comes to mind immediately is Sex at Dawn, uh, which is a broad concept book, not a how-to book, but it's it really came out and a lot of people read it and thought, oh my gosh, like really? That, that could be a thing. You know, the idea is that it may not actually be our natural state to be monogamous. And so once we start to sort of play with the belief system and mythology around what a relationship should look like, then all of a sudden the world kind of opens up and people start wondering, oh, well, that's interesting. That's intellectually interesting. Or there's some aspect of that that feels right to me. I wonder if I could explore it. So after that book came out, I started to see a lot of people just thinking, well, why not me? Like, let's try it. And some people who make an attempt to open their relationship do great and some not so well. As some are prepared, some less prepared, uh, which is, you know, where I think a good therapist can really come in to help people succeed with the project. But a lot of people tried it. And then since then, there have been some TV series and some movies and stuff. Most of them I could lodge a lot of complaints about. But I mean, anytime you're doing a media depiction of a marginalized kind of relationship or community, there's going to be a lot missing. And also when there's just a small handful of them, and obviously they're written for drama, right? So I haven't seen anything that seemed particularly accurate or to reflect anything like the majority of the open relationships that I see as a therapist, but, but there are, they do exist in the media. And then, then there again, people see it and they think, oh, huh, why not me? Well, I so like that. I Go ahead. I don't know that it's necessarily more, a huge amount more common, but I do think it's way more visible. And I bet both are true. Well, I, I, I can totally see that with like all all types of depiction of marginalized people. Like it, it, it can be too narrow or like, you know, I think the issue is we don't have the kind of like good representation. But you're right. It opens up the door for people to be curious about this. Kind of like thinking about if this is something that would work for my relationship or not. And it was interesting in the book that you talk about, you recommend it to people. In what context you recommend? it to people what's the reaction <laughs> <laughs> I do occasionally recommend it well you know I used to be a midwife so when I was a midwife my entire all of my work was based on informed consent what I believe about everything basically is that you should know what your options are and then you're a smart person you figure out what's a good fit for you so we talk about the pros and cons of this test or that test and what are all the reasons why somebody might do it? What are all the reasons why somebody might not? Why is it recommended or why is it not recommended and for whom? In a, as unbiased a way as possible so that people know what their options are and have some way to begin thinking about it so that they can take an internal read then and figure out what's right for them. And I think that that way of working for so many years really is part of my way that I see the world now. So to me, if a monogamous couple is struggling with something that I've seen people fix by opening their relationship, I'm going to say so. You know, I'm going to say, well, you know, I, here's an idea. You can take it or leave it, but 
I work with lots of people in open relationships, and this is one of those problems that could be solved by it. And I wonder what you think about that. And people do not hesitate to tell me, oh, you're full of shit. You know, like, there's no way I'm ever going to do that. And I'll be like, fine, no problem. But some people are like, surprise me and say, yeah, we've discussed that on and off for five years. And I'm like, whoa. Because, you know, you get an idea in your head of what kind of person is going to consider opening their relationship. But most of the people in my practice who talk to me about opening their relationships are in 20, 25, 30 year long marriages. They're in middle age. They have empty nests or almost. And they're really looking at a long, long term relationship that they don't want to lose. It's got lots and lots of benefits. And they're not sure that they want to continue living with either a huge desire discrepancy or they want some relief from whatever, you know. And when you think about it, we used to die a lot younger. I'm not sure that from a biological standpoint, we were necessarily cut out for monogamous relationships that lasted 50 years, right? And yet now we expect that our monogamous 50 year long relationship would still be super sexy and hot all of that time. And I think that it's not that surprising that somebody in a 35 year long marriage might be thinking, gosh, I wonder what it'd be like to have new love again. And if I could have that and also still have all the incredible richness and connection and love longevity and stability of my marriage. Well, you know, when when I think about polyamory, polyamory, polyamory is about having more love and who wouldn't want more love <laughs> in their life? <laughs> so it's certainly a positive thing. But at times, I, one of the fear that I hear from my clients when they're exploring this is that if I offer my partner freedom to choose now after two decades, three decades, what if they don't choose me back? So I think that can be a scary situation. For sure, that's a scary situation. And that's one of those things that stops people from trying it. And that's why I don't actually have an opinion that people should or shouldn't open their relationship. I just think if you want to open your relationship, you should be able to get some good help for it. But I think that idea that probably I'm just giving my partner an opportunity to leave me for somebody like younger and hotter or something like that is a little skewed. So it's an idea that's based on our cultural norm of monogamy, where if somebody develops a crush on a colleague at work, all of a sudden, all this stuff goes on in their head. Do I pursue it? Do I not pursue it? Then I'll have to lie or leave. Those are our choices. I could lie or I could leave. And so either I don't have this connection with this person and I shut down this thing that's exciting or I pursue it and lie about it at home or I choose between a long-term stable relationship where I otherwise was not thinking of leaving and this brand new person who I have no idea whatsoever who they are or what we could or couldn't do together, right? And I think it's so flawed because in that early stage of relationship, we're so flooded with excitement and all the good hormones and all the excitement and all that stuff. Uh, it's really, really hard to say no to that. And then we're in a relationship with somebody that we don't know at all. And now we're going to start getting to know them. And what's going to happen as a relationship therapist, I, you know, all of us could, would happily just endorse the promise that the blush will go off the rose, like, you know, that super hot period, it's going to end. And then you're going to be looking at each other and you're going to be noticing that you have some significant differences. And that might happen six months down the road, or it might happen three years down the road, but it's going to happen. And at that point, that's the point where we start breaking up with partners because we're really, really different. And in fact, we may be catastrophically different at that point. So when you think about how many people you've been seriously involved with in the course of your life, for most of us, it's not like tons. And how many people have you been with for like a decade or more? In my case, one, the one I've been with for 26 years, and I'm still with now, right? And that's the case for most people, like the one you've been that you are with is the one that you've been with for the longest. And so I use this as a way to start to conceptualize that new love. It's not very likely to stand the test of time. 
So I think it's really tragic for that to be the thing that makes us think we have to break up. That is the idea of serial monogamy. And it does so much damage to relationships that otherwise might really thrive. But to me, the choice is, would you rather have infidelity or polyamory? And I would rather have polyamory. So I'd rather have my clients being transparent with each other about what they want and about what they're doing and consensually involved in a discussion and a process about that and have the ability to choose to keep their relationship if it's working for them rather than infidelity that is going to result in a massive crisis involving lies and secrecy. And now you also have to heal from the secrets and the lies, as well as figure out what to do with a very complicated relationship situation. So I think people think like, if I had to choose between monogamy and polyamory, well, I would choose monogamy because it's more secure. Well, first of all, it's not necessarily more secure, as I would say, look at the infidelity, like it's, it's, you think it's more secure, but infidelity happens. So I think the more accurate question is, would you prefer the option of polyamory or the option of infidelity? Because I'm not sure how many people actually achieve monogamy. Definitely. I think if, as you mentioned, that maybe like 100 years ago that we were dying younger, that would be easier because you would be with your partner a couple of decades, but now like people are together for 50 50 years and 60 years. And it's normal for sexual experiences to change throughout the lifespan. It could be different for different part of the couples. And this could be another way that people can navigate their kind of like sexual differences, as you mentioned, or bringing excitement. And what when people say that about like, what if my if I open the kind of like the door to a consensual non-monogamy, my partner will now choose me. But I feel like this kind of thinking about it that way, like it's just really unsexy than thinking about my partner is with me because I trapped them in this relationship. And the moment I open the door, they run away. <laughs> I don't want to be in that relationship. So I think it's come from this place of deep fear that some people have. Well, yeah. And I think that's exactly right. It comes from a sort of core insecurity that maybe all of us have on some level that if somebody really knew us, they would ultimately leave us. I think we all fear that. But if you're not thinking that you have to choose between two partners, my question is, why would you ever have to leave anybody? Like, then you can actually decide, am I getting enough out of this relationship to want to stay, even though it doesn't meet all of my needs? And one of the unfortunate things about monogamy, aside from the, I will just say, ridiculous idea of serial monogamy, is that one partner is supposed to somehow meet all the needs. Or one partner is supposed to meet all the needs that you can't get met by your closest friends who you clearly have platonic and non-sexual relationships with. That just is so very, very limiting. What if one of the needs that you have that is not getting met in your marriage is sex? You can't get that met by a platonic friend. And so now we're back to, I have to find somebody to do that so that I can have that in my life. But the price for that is I have to give up all the richness and amazing connection that I have with this other person. It's just, it's just kind of tragic I think it can be very tragic you're right and I feel like we're but when we're opening the door I feel like if that's something that's like people in a monogamous relationship and now they want to open the this kind of exploration door of the consensual non-monogamy it can open up a door to many of our own emotional experiences with insecurity feeling feeling scared so I think that can be a very tough place for many people and I, I love in your book you talked about differentiation can you tell us for our audience that they're not therapists. Tell us more what, what differentiation means. Yeah, I would define differentiation as having three parts and a foundation. So the first part is the ability to look inside yourself and figure out what you think and feel and prefer separate from what anybody else's opinion might be. The second part is being able to get grounded in yourself so that you can say that to somebody else, even if you think they're not going to feel comfortable hearing it. The third part is being able to get steady and stay steady so that your partner can say something to you that's hard for you to hear yet you still stay in the conversation and access curiosity about their experience. And then the foundation beneath all of that is being able to get grounded and hold steady and manage your emotional reactions enough so that all of that can happen. 
And the reason why that's important is we can't have a healthy relationship without it. Like we, we can't figure out if you can't figure out what you want, you can't say it. And if you can't get grounded in yourself enough to say what you want, how in the world are you going to build a relationship that has the qualities that you want or that in any way meets your needs? It's a, the difference between oh, this relationship is good by a happy accident versus this relationship is good because we had a conversation about it. We understood one another and we figured it out. And I can tell you which of those I would rather put my money on. I would rather put my money on the relationship. I don't care if it's monogamous or open or what, where people are having conversations, solving problems that meet both of their needs and coming up with solutions and moving forward. If we have to wait for circumstances to line up so that we can be happy, there's going to be a lot of unhappiness because I don't know about you, but I don't get my way multiple times every single day. So I have to have some other way to access happiness other than everything went my way today, you know. And I, and I like that the idea of being able to have this difficult conversation and being able to be at the receiver end of it, right? I think like sometimes people get so scared, when, even in monogamous relationship, when their partner have a desire or they, they talk about something that's difficult for them to hear. And we hear it in, in kind of like a sexual kind of realm a lot that people are kind of scared that if my partner is saying what they desire, then uh, there is this pressure I have to deliver. So I feel like that's something that the, all couple can benefit from cultivating the skill. Agreed. And that points to something important. Just because your partner asks for something does not mean that you are obligated to deliver it. So one of the kinds of couples that I love working with, and that I hope there will soon be many, many therapists who enjoy working with are the ones where one partner is interested in opening up and the other partner is really not so sure. Because that's a couple who has a very, very hard time finding a good therapist. It's really, really hard if you're if you don't know anything about polyamory and you've never actually seen a polyamorous relationship that lasted for 25 years and it's just gorgeous. If you've never seen that, it's very, very hard to work with a couple like that. It seems like the person who is pulling for monogamy is stands to lose everything. And the person who's pulling for polyamory stands to win everything. And there has to be a way to see that situation where it's not a war and it's not a tug of war. And the love of two people is not something that can get sliced and diced and divided up and dealt out. And if you get more than I get less. There just has to be another way of seeing it. And that is why I wrote the book. I really wrote the book for the clients that need the therapists that read the book. <laughs> that was my plan. Well, I think that's, that's a, such a valuable resource because I feel most therapists, at least the one I, I, I practice in LA and most people I know that therapists are wonderful with holding space for many things that clients bring in and couples bring into their consultation rooms. But I feel when it comes to this kind of exploration and, and big ambivalence that people have about relationship structure, some, something kind of impacts, it almost triggers their own therapist and then they they turn to this uh, turning vote, like a, a kind of third person in this party that are voting for monogamy. And I feel that can be challenging and alienating to, to the couple and specifically the person who's exploring the kind of opening up this relationship. So what are some of the myths that you hear that some therapists have about consensual non-monogamy? Well, one myth is that it doesn't work and it can't stand the test of time. It's just a phase that you're going through. It'll pass or it's really only good for short term relationships. So you could have like a bunch of little short flings or something like that, but you wouldn't expect any of them to last and you wouldn't expect the original one to last. Not true. Another one is that adding other relationships diminishes the quality of the original relationship. This is so not true. I've seen it instead very, very much enhance the connection between the original couple. And there are lots and lots of ways that that can work. Another myth is that it's super, super hard. It might be super hard, but it doesn't have to be super hard. Another myth is that people who are in open relationships just don't experience jealousy. That is not true. People who are in open relationships experience jealousy all the time. And it's one of the things that therapists who work with people in polyamorous relationships should be good at working with jealousy in some kind of a way that's actually helpful. 
and not sort of victim based. Another myth is that it's just exactly like a monogamous relationship and the same skills should, should apply. And I think that our earlier discussion about the sort of mindset difference between the sort of serial monogamy, you have to choose structure and you literally don't have to choose. You do not have to get rid of a relationship that's not the be all and end all of relationships. That is a very significant difference. And one of the sort of sources of some magic in therapy around polyamory is knowing how to help people make that cultural leap from the serial monogamy idea to the how exactly would you decide to leave and why would you like if you can keep all of them why would like what would you leave changes the rubric completely to I would leave you because I'm not getting everything I want to I would only leave you if you're doing something I cannot tolerate, right? So that's a super different way of viewing the world. So there's a handful of myths. I'm sure that there are some other ones too. Well, you know, one one thing that that really helped me to evolve my view of kind of monogamous, non-monogamous relationship, all of those things, because as, as you know, and my listeners know, I grew up in, in Iran. And although my mom had friends that they were non-monogamous and like even her, their parents were non-monogamous, which was interesting, but I never had access to seeing people's lives that they're in a non-monogamous relationships happily until I, I like became a therapist. So I know many colleagues that they are modeling that. And I think having that representation, seeing it or leaving it, I think that can be very powerful. That's why I think like your book is, is a wonderful tool and other books that talk about this and also the movies that are curious, accurately depicting this. Yes. One of the things I included in my book for this exact reason is some personal accounts from people who have experienced some big challenges with polyamory or who are living out ways of doing polyamory that are generally thought not to work. I really wanted to give people an, a real view of real people doing the exact things that you're not supposed to be able to do. For instance, there are accounts of people who are in a mono polyam relationship. So one partner identifies as monogamous and the other partner identifies as polyamorous. That can work just fine. There are accounts there of people who really have had huge struggles with jealousy and figured out ways to work through them. There's one story by a bisexual woman who dated a couple. It's another thing that's not supposed to happen, even to the point that she would be referred to as a unicorn. And it's supposed to be so rare and it's not that rare and it's not like it's not feasible. So there's a story about that. There's a story, a couple of stories from young people who were raised in relationships where their parents had multiple partners talking about their experience of that. So I just, I wanted people to see sort of the real deal. I've got an example of don't ask, don't tell in there, which is another thing that is supposed to not work. But for, for some people, it works really well and is the thing that makes it work. So I think there's so much diversity in how a relationship can work. And I'm hoping that my message is just help your client from wherever they are, get to where they want to get with their life and their relationship. And don't worry so much about whether you think it's possible, you know, focus more on asking your client questions like, where do you want to get with this? What's your part in it? And how can I help you be the partner you want to be showing up in this relationship, whatever the struggle is, and more get off of the idea like, you should do it this way, or you need to do it that way, or these are your options. Just like, ugh, maybe instead a little more open-minded approach and the theory that people can do what they want to do and maybe they can find their way, even if you've never seen it before. I love that, that you included kind of like some, I know some theories, some scientific background, but also real stories of people kind of lived experiences because I think like not everyone have access to having the accurate accurate kind of information about the gamuts of experiences people have when it comes to monogamy, non-monogamy and all everything in between. So I highly recommend your book for therapists and even when people are curious to learn more about consensual non-monogamy. So if people are curious, where can they find it? They can find it at Amazon. Uh, they can find it at my publisher's website, which is Roman Littlefield. 
think that's roman.com, R-O-W-M-A-N.com. And they can find it at my local bookseller in Madison, Wisconsin, which is A Room of One's Own. And my name is Martha Kelpie. There is no other Martha Kelpie in the world, I believe. So if you put Martha Kelpie into the Amazon search engine or any other search engine, you'll certainly bring up me and um, it won't be hard to find my book from there. Awesome. Wonderful. I leave a link in the show notes to the website so people can access it. Thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your expertise with us. I hope you guys found our conversation useful. I always enjoy having Martha on the show. And it's interesting, the kind of question I get when I talk about polyamory, I host a weekly room on Clubhouse under one of my friends that are very well known in Iranian community. He has his own podcast and he wanted me to come every week to talk about sex and relationship in, in his club. And they wanted me to talk about consensual non-monogamy, open relationships. And one of the number one questions that I was getting in that room because people were thinking, okay, this sounds great, but I don't know anyone who, who were able to implement this successfully. These are just ideas. How do you know it's going to work? So I was kind of curious if you are listening to this show and you are identifying as someone that has a history with consensual non-monogamy or you are in a polyamorous relationships, I would love it if you can send us a brief audio of a couple of minutes and let us know about your story of how did you get into exploring this kind of relationship, what worked and what haven't worked. So perhaps I can share it with other people because I know lots of clients that they are in these types of relationships, but I cannot retell their stories. So I would be curious to hear your story. So you can record it. You can record your voice on sexologypodcast.com or you can record the audio and send it to us at help at oasis2care.com. I'll talk to you next week. Thanks for listening to Sexology Podcast. For more great content, visit www.sexologypodcast.com. Please be advised that information presented on this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health provider.